So let's look at an example of finding critical points. Uh, what we need to do, what we end up doing often is, almost all the time, is solving a nonlinear system of equations, which is not something that we talk a lot about, this, the systematic ways of doing that. And they can be very, very hard, but we don't uh, usually do super hard examples. So let's see what happens. We've got a function, f of xy, given by this formula. And we'd like to know where the critical points are. And I'll go ahead and classify one of them, but I'm not going to classify all of them. So the first thing we do is we look at the derivatives. The x derivative is going to be minus 4x um, plus 2xy. And we're going to set that equal to 0 and to get one of the conditions for a critical point. We're going to look at fy, the y derivative. That's going to be minus 10y plus 3y squared plus x squared. And we're going to set that equal to 0. Another way to say this is we're setting the gradient equal to 0, or we're saying the tangent plane has to be horizontal. That's what it means to be a critical point if all the derivatives are nice. If there's any not nice points, any points where it's not differential, you should check those two. But for a um, polynomial, obviously it's not going to have any non differentiable points. OK, so. Um, how do we solve a system like this? It's not linear. We shouldn't try to do like elimination or matrices or anything like that. Um, we want to look at which one is simpler, basically, usually. Um, there's some places, sometimes when you have lots of symmetry, you can do clever things like play them off against each other in, by dividing one against the other, perhaps. But this is a pretty typical case where we're going to look at one of them that's simpler. And if you notice here, this guy's simpler because it has a common factor. Always think about factoring as an option. It's not always the default thing. But that first one factors, OK? And so it factors as, let's see, there's a 2x that comes out of it. And then you get minus 2 plus y equals 0. Aha. That breaks into cases, OK? So case 1 is where x equals 0, OK? So this is very common. We're going to get a kind of a tree of cases. It's not going to be a super complicated tree. But in some cases, it actually can be complicated. One of the one equation we focused on first, and it, it, it didn't have to be focused on first, but it was definitely a good idea because it was simpler, breaks up into, it's going to break up into two cases. Then, given that x equals 0, we've used up that equation for right now. We'll come back to it in the other case. And we want to look at what the other equation says. OK? So um, when x equals 0, that's going to simplify this dramatically. And that's going to let us solve it. OK, so if x equals 0, then we're just going to rewrite that second equation with x set to 0. OK, and now this does factor. OK, and so that's going to be y times minus 10 plus 3y equals 0. I'm not saying they always, always, always factor like this, but in simple book examples, they tend to. OK, so we're going to get um, y equals 0 or y equals 10 thirds. OK, now really what we're getting is two points, because remember, these are all both on the, under the assumption that x equals 0. 0, 0, and 0, 10 thirds. OK, we found two critical points. But we're not done, because that wasn't the only case from the fx equation. We're going to look at case um, 2. That's going to be where, OK, what was the um, other case here? Ah, the other way this could have been equal 0 is y equals 2. Or, yeah, y equals 2. Mm, let's put that in math mode. OK. All right, so what happens there? Well, if we put y equals 2, that's going to simplify this equation again. OK. We're going to get uh, minus 20 plus 6, um, no, plus 12 uh, plus x squared equals 0. Or x squared equals, it's x squared minus 8, so x squared equals 8. And so x equals plus or minus root 8, which is 2 root 2. OK, so but what are the points? Well, these were under the assumption that y was equal to 2. And so we're going to get plus or minus 2 root 2, comma 2. OK, so that's actually two more points. Plus or minus is a little tricky. There's some complicated examples where you're going to get two different quantities, or even sometimes three, like the x, y, and z, that all can be different sign. Please only use plus or minus once in any particular expression, because if you could tell me like plus or minus 2 root 2, plus or minus 2, it's kind of ambiguous. Do you mean they have to be the same sign, or could they all be, be all four possibilities? You should really write them out. If there's only one plus or minus, then it's fine. It's a nice, convenient way to say it. So we've got four critical points. Let me point out one more um, major pitfall here that people often do. Um, 
it's not super common when it's written like this, but it's not uncommon. People get worried, uh, their subconscious takes over, and they just say, oh, I'm just going to divide this equation by x. Okay. If you divide that equation by x, you're only going to get this part of it. Well, you might have the 2 still. You're not going to get this case x equals 0. Okay. So um, very, very, very important. And similarly, yeah, um, yeah, that's really the place where you'd get it. Okay. So the motto is don't divide by a variable if not needed. Okay. Now there's some places where it's really helpful, especially when you're playing one equation off against each other by dividing, where you actually are going to maybe unavoidably do it. Okay. If you do, okay, you need to separately check. I know I'm shouting with these caps, but it's really important. It's intentional. If you do separately check the case where that variable equals zero. Okay. So a, a not as good way to do this up here would have been saying, OK, I'm going to divide by zero, by, divide by x here. And I'm going to get minus 4 plus 2y equals 0. That's simpler. But then I'd have to make a check. Hey, wait a minute. I just assumed that x was not equal to 0. What if it is equal to 0? OK. That basically, there's a better way. that We did it a better way, which is we factored and then just said, oh, when the product of two things equals 0, either one is 0 or the other. But there are some cases where it's really tempting to divide by a variable. But please, please, please don't do it without checking whether that variable can equal 0. OK? Um, now, uh, just to finish it up, don't want to get too long, um, let's just pick one point. In general, you would take all four of these points, um, and we're going to calculate the Hessian and see what the type is. OK? So let's just go ahead and get the second derivatives. OK? fxx is pretty easy. Um, that's going to be minus 4 plus 2y. Fyy is going to be the y derivative of this guy. That's going to be minus 10 plus 6y. And the mixed partial is going to be, um, it's either the derivative of this with respect to y or this with respect to x. Well, let's do both to check. Uh, derivative of this with respect to y is 2x. Derivative of this with respect to x, it's 2x. Yay, they work. OK. Math still works. OK. So um, you can put these into the master formula and even get a grungy big formula for the determinant of the Hessian, the d quantity. But that's not usually that necessary. Let's just pick one point. And to be lazy, I'm just going to pick at, at 0, 0. Um, we're going to get hf equals, and let's put it in a little matrix. 2 by 2, brackets is good. OK. Um, so I'm just going to plug in 0, 0. So minus 4 and minus 10 for the diagonals, and 0, 0 here. OK. And so d is the determinant of that, which is just the product of the diagonals, which is 40. That's greater than 0. OK. And so remember, that means either max or min. But that in itself doesn't tell us. But if you look at either of these numbers, they're both negative. They had to be the same quant same sign, or else this wouldn't have come out positive. And because it's negative, that's concave down, basically. And so um, since f x x and f y y are less than 0, that says it's a local max. So yeah, let me say it's a, a local or relative max, definitely not necessarily a, a global max. Okay. Now, um, let's see what the graph looks like. I actually have it prepared here. Okay. So you can see at the origin, it's a nice little local max, but it's definitely not the absolute max of this function. And it's x. We could have figured that by the fact that it's only even powers in x. If you look at the form, behavior here and y, not super surprising. And what you've got is another, there's another local min, and then there's a saddle here and a saddle here. So if you do the, the complete analysis, which I encourage you to do if you want, you should get a, uh, a local min at, let's go back to where those points were. Um, the local min is 0, 10 thirds. That was that little pit. And these guys turn out to be saddles. All right.